Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Eric Corum, founder of AIM7. Welcome back to The Blueprint, where we distill cutting-edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your busy lifestyle and goals. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Amy Bender. Dr. Bender is the Director of Clinical Sleep Science at Cerebra, a sleep health technology startup, and she's an adjunct assistant professor of kinesiology at the University of Calgary. Dr. Bender received her PhD and Master of Science degrees in experimental psychology from Washington State University, specializing in sleep EEG. She has helped develop the only validated sleep screening tool for athletes and has implemented sleep optimization strategies for numerous Canadian Olympic and professional teams. Today, we discuss how remote work and commute duration impact your sleep quality and quantity. We also discuss social jet lag, the benefits of going to bed earlier versus later, sleep chronotypes, and so much more. So now, it's time to lean in and learn from the best. Dr. Bender, thank you so much for joining me today on The Blueprint. I'm really excited to talk about my favorite subject, which is sleep. And I want to start by asking you about some something I saw you tweeting about. Uh, I don't know if it was one of the conventions you went to, but there's some interesting research now on how remote work may impact our sleep, Uh, some some things like social jet lag. So I'd love to hear your take on that. What some trends that you're seeing? Yeah, absolutely. I um, recently attended the European Sleep Research Society conference in Greece, and there was a poster there on the association between remote work opportunities and sleep quality. And this, in particular, it was a sample of uh, Finnish adults, so hopefully generalizable to, to us as well. What they found was that the people who worked remote, they are more associated with greater sleep on the weekdays, but not necessarily the weekends. They found decrease in social jet lag. So social jet lag is kind of that mismatch between your free days and your work days or your school days and your weekends, you know, that the greater the mismatch between your midpoint of sleep on each of those, the more kind of negative health implications. So they found there was less social jet lag in those who were working remote. And then it seemed to be more beneficial for those who are more of that evening chronotype. So Mm -hmm. more of those night owls who like to go to bed later, wake up later, seem to benefit the most, although all the chronotypes uh, seem to benefit from this type of work style. And kind of thinking about how this works a little bit. So there's been some time use surveys. So different things that you do throughout the day and how that's associated with sleep time. And when you look at this research, there's a lot having to do with the more time you commute, the less sleep time you have overall. And so I think that is probably having to do a lot with this research is that, you know, you roll out of bed, you have a five minute commute down to the basement or to the office. And so there's just more of an opportunity for sleep there especially with during the pandemic, we found that people were actually going to bed a little bit later, waking up later, maybe getting, you know, 10, 15 minutes more sleep on average. And that was probably likely having to do with uh, not having to commute into work. This is really interesting because when I, I used to work in sports and in that world, everything starts early. As a matter of fact, one of the teams I was with, unfortunately, the start time for work every day was 6 a.m. And it was long days. And so my wake up time was like 445. And then I would drive in. And then recently I saw some pictures of myself when I was working there. I was like, I did not look healthy at all. Oh wow! Granted, it was also an unhealthy work environment. But now that I work from home, I still get up early around 5.45 or 6, but I have more control over my morning. If I feel like I need a little bit more sleep, I can do that. This is really interesting. Do you think the reason people went to bed later during the pandemic is just out of boredom? Like maybe they were trying to fill their day? I mean, I think it's more of a biological drive here. So I think it was more related to more in line with their circadian rhythm. So they're not 
constrained to having to get up so early to commute into work. I don't know. That's my personal take is that I think it was more related to being more in line with their circadian rhythm. I'm going to bed a little bit later, waking up a little bit later. And there was a study. So where, when I said there was about 15 minutes more of sleep on average, this was in Fitbit users. And I, I don't recall exactly. It was a ton of people in this particular study. And they found actually with just that 10 to 15 minutes more of sleep on average, they found heart rate optimization as well. So I think, I think it was lower heart rate on average across the night. They were finding that trend. So it seemed as if it was correlated to physical heart rate as well. If you are ready to unlock the power of your wearable device to help you look, feel, and perform your best, then you should check out AIM7. AIM7 is the company that I founded that is revolutionizing the usefulness of wearable data by providing you with daily recommendations for your mind, body, and recovery so you can build the capacity to take on more physical and mental stress with less cost. And this solution works. In just the first four weeks, the average AIM-7 member lowers their stress by 31%, reduces soreness by 19%, as well as experiencing improvements in sleep, motivation, and they complete 38% more workouts. You can get early access by clicking the link in the show notes or by going to www.aim7.com. Now, back to the show. Talking about evening versus morning chronotypes, What percentage of the population is truly an evening chronotype? Do you know roughly? I think there was one study. I think it was roughly about 15% or so. 15% were more of that uh, late evening chronotype on average, you know, wanting to go to bed past 1 a.m., 2 a.m., wanting to wake up, you know, 9 a.m. or so. And then about 15% were more of those extreme early morning types. Mm-hmm. So going to bed, you know, 9 p.m., waking up before 6 a.m., for example. And the rest of us kind of fall in between. So about 70% are kind of that intermediate type. There isn't a clear cut uh, preference or biological preference for being that type of chronotype. So I've, I've been noticing trends with social media, things like that. And our behavior is actually impacting when we're going to bed. Like our, we're almost like depriving ourselves of sleep because we want to engage in these types of activities. There was a paper done. Oh, I don't know if it was 18 months ago or 12 months ago, it came out. It was a huge study with the Broad Institute at MIT and Harvard and the UK Biobank where it was talking about sleep onset and going to bed later led to significant increases in major depression. Did you see this? Mm, I saw that. Yeah, actually, I, uh, I listened to one of your podcasts and you mentioned this um, paper in there as I was preparing myself. Um, <laughs> And yeah, I did. I did. I didn't get a chance to fully read it, but yes, it is. It is very interesting in the fact, and it kind of goes against my hypothesis. So All right. my hypothesis is that if you are an evening type, your sleep quality is going to be better if you were to go to bed later, because your sleep is in line with your melatonin release. So Mm. as a part of being an evening type, we release melatonin later. And so that's like with adolescents, people will say, and especially I hear this in the sports world where these kids aren't disciplined if they um, aren't getting up on time to make it to their 6 a.m. training. Um, and I'm just kind of laughing to myself because I'm like, they're not biologically ready to go to bed at 8 p.m. because their melatonin is being released much later. Isn't there a change in the teenage years where kids naturally want to stay up a little bit later and there's a little bit of shift? Am I correct about that or am I, am I wrong about that? Yes. So there is a shift from early childhood, um, school aged into adolescence where I think it was around age 19 is kind of that peak in night owlness. So Mm. biologically melatonin is being released later in, in the majority of these individuals. Of course, there's individual differences, but we do see a shift towards evening type, evening chronotype 
during adolescence. And then once we hit around 50s, 60s, 70s, we revert back to being more of an early bird type. So my hypothesis is that people would actually sleep better if they sleep more in line with their chronotype. And the research I think that you were highlighting was showing that if they get to bed earlier, they're actually getting potentially more light exposure in the morning. Of course, this is uh, associations as well. So I, I don't know if we've really proved the answer to that. And currently in our, our research, we're actually trying to look at that as well. So we have a 20 night study. So we did 20 nights of in-home polysomnography. So we're looking at brainwave activity. And we also recorded uh, daytime lifestyle factors. We recorded how much time they spent outside, how much time they exercise, when they had caffeine, when they had alcohol, et cetera. And what we're going to do with that data is actually look at the midpoint, the objective midpoint of sleep mm -hmm. using polysomnography to see if those who preferred, those who were more of an evening type on a questionnaire actually slept better when they had sleep midpoints that were later. So we really want to be able to look at that more objectively to really understand. But I think it's a good, a good debate in, in the field right now is should people be sleeping more in line with their chronotype? Personally, I think so. But this research that you're presenting as well showed that people who were going to bed earlier, waking up earlier, potentially had more light exposure, which then could improve their sleep quality at night. And that's kind of another angle as well. Yeah, this is interesting. So if somebody would want to figure out their chronotype, how would you suggest that they do that? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's questionnaires, there's probably online questionnaires you could do to figure that out. Um, so there's the composite scale of morningness, eveningness, there's the morningness, eveningness questionnaire. So there's different ways you can do that. But I mean, I think just subjectively helps you as well. So are you, do you tend to get a lot of your energy at night? Do you tend to feel better when you stay up later? You get up later. Do you tend to feel better if you go to bed early, wake up early, that kind of thing? So I think people can figure it out that way. But I will say there's really only three types of chronotypes based on the science. And that's the morning, the intermediate and the evening. There isn't, you know, wolf, pig. I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know what these animals are. But it's just, just a of, way to make money. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> uh, that's not really rooted in science. I love that. Well, this is a fabulous conversation. I think a lot of people could benefit from understanding their sleep pattern and then leaning into that as kind of you're saying. So if you're an evening person, lean into that. And in our next discussion, we're going to talk a little bit more about sleep duration. So that will be kind of a continuation of this. Well, if you are an evening person, what should that sleep period look like? So I'm excited to talk about that. Sounds good. Thanks. Thanks again for listening to the Blueprint Podcast. And if you want to support the show, please consider leaving us a comment and review on the Apple Podcast app. Thanks again for listening. And I'll catch you on the next episode.